Yeah, yeah. So it was just a time issue because we are a couple of hundred kilometers away, so it takes takes a while until the satellites react. So that's uh, so. Uh, so thank you very much, uh, Professor Koreanu, and it's a pleasure to for me to speak to my Romanian uh, colleagues. Obviously, I would have loved to be uh, at your congress uh, in beautiful Romania, but uh, due to the corona situation, which unfortunately is getting, getting more and more severe also in, in, in Germany, uh, of course, we are not able to travel and have to give our lectures remotely. And it's a pleasure for me to do so because I think it's uh, it's it's uh, certainly a very nice uh, medium in order to do this, even though we would, of course, greatly uh, prefer a, a physical meeting. So thank you very much for giving me uh, the, the talk. Back in addition in rheumatoid arthritis, paradigm shifts are just more tools. You see here, this is our hospital where we are located on the 21st ward, overlooking uh, Berlin. And on the right-hand side, you see the Rheumatism Research Center, with, with which we tightly interact. So now let's have a look into the past. And that's quite interesting because uh, you, you may remember the uh, pyramid uh, that was put forward by the ACR. I thought this was decades ago, but actually its primer is only from 1993. And at that time it says, well, what are our goals and treatment? And there the foundation of the pyramid uh, was stated consists of uh, of rest and uh, oops of rest and uh, uh, combined with basic anti-inflammatory therapy with salicylates or other NSAIDs and they said within the pyramid additional therapies may be added to the foundation the exact timing and order of added drugs is variable and you see this in the pyramid on the right hand side and obviously what we have done uh, today is uh, destroy this pyramid. Hello? Uh, can you hear me? Oh, so, uh, everything cannot, is perfect. I cannot advance the slide, so maybe use, there is use a, the arrows. I do. It does not move. And also the cursor doesn't move. It's stalled. Yeah, now it's moving again. It's, it's moving again. All right. No, my my image is stalled on the uh, on the screen. I cannot move it. Hmm. Ah, now it's moving again. I'm sorry. I don't know what 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 the, is causing the delay. Maybe the uh, it's the internet tension, line so it it needs some times to move. Yeah, yeah. So probably the interline internet lines are so busy uh, that it takes a while until. So the mouse working again, and here you see this uh, this broad pyramid. So obviously we have changed our uh, ways uh, significantly, mm. and. Please wait a little bit because it's not moving. Here you see the uh, revolution in the treatment of rheumatic diseases. So we started with glucocorticoids in the 50s. Then, of course, methotrexate is a very, very important uh, addition in 1988. And then finally, uh, the uh, biologics came. <clears throat> you all see here. And uh, currently, we are in the... Uh, era of the small molecules. It started with tofacitinib, and uh, then we went to uh, baricitinib, and also eucalacitinib has now been approved, and by the EMA, agotinib has been approved as the fourth agent available now in Europe, and in Japan, there's also pifacitinib, which has been approved and is also used. Okay. So uh, here you see this, and the next slide shows you the advantages and disadvantages of biologics. So they are uh, very specific. They have few of target effects, so there is no interaction with the cytochrome. They usually have a good safety profile, at least those that we are using, uh, and they have a long half-life. There is a good patent situation, 
good revenue situation. <clears throat> On the uh, con side, <clears throat> the uh, biologics have a complex mode of action. Sometimes there is a difficult dose finding. Parental administration is necessary. Expensive to manufacture antibody formation against therapeutic reagents. And therefore, uh, could we also use more molecules to help us here? Then, uh, so this is uh, a question. What is the future? Are these uh, small molecules? Uh, and some of them <laughs> call these small molecules honorary biologics. And so the question is, is it time to say goodbye to syringes, as you see here on this slide? So uh, the Jack Stat pathway has been beautifully introduced to you by Ernest Choi. I will just reiterate a little bit. So we have Jack 1, 2, and 3, and the fourth one is called TIC2. And they can all combine pretty much with, with, with each other even with themselves, and therefore uh, mediate the actions of certain cytokines, as you see here. And we have uh, basically four compounds here, tofacitinib, paracitinib, vagotinib, and tupaticitinib, with different selectivities for the various jet molecules. So it all started with tofacitinib, and since we know this drug quite well, I will just allude to a few, um, I think, very important findings regarding this agent. Uh, so, because the question at that time was, do these drugs also work in patients who have failed a biologic treatment? And this is something we address, as you see here, early in the 2010s, in the oral step study, where we used tofacitinib 5 and tofacitinib 10 milligrams uh, compared to placebo, and then the placebo patients were switched to the active drug. We all know that tofacitinib uh, 10 milligram is no longer used in uh, rheumatoid arthritis. We, we uh, at least in Europe, we use the five milligrams PIT. And the results are shown here. Yes, indeed, even if you had failed the biologic, these new small molecules, in this case, tofacitinib worked actually with a good response uh, already at uh, month three and uh, went further on until the subsequent months. So the next question was, what about the safety of these new drugs? And this has been nicely addressed in this paper by Jürgen Bollenhaupt and other colleagues, including also Stan Cohen, addressing the safety and efficacy of tofacitinib for up to 9.5 years in the treatment of rheumatoid arthritis. And they present here the uh, results of a global open-label long-term extension study. So these are the results. Basically, I mean, you can always criticize these long-term extensions because only patients who do well usually remain on the drugs and those who have side effects drop out. But nevertheless, you see here a stable ACR response over a long period of time. So uh, they... They appear to work and have a good safety profile over an extended period of time. And that's why other companies also embarked on that here. Takes a while uh, that uh, this desernotinib didn't make it into the uh, clinical group, but uh, TOFA, as I mentioned, baricitinib, Uparacitinib, and finally also uh, filgotinib in Europe and pefacitinib in Asia. So now let's go to the next uh, drug that came along. This is called paracitinib, nicely already explained to you by Ernest Choi. And uh, here I will only show you one trial because this really was a, a pivotal trial uh, addressing uh, the comparison between a JAK1-2 inhibitor and uh, um, a biologic, in this case, Adalimumab. So this study was called RA Beam. And if you look to the lower left-hand panel, you will see here that uh, it was uh, not, it was quite, quite a, an ambitious task to, to say 
uh, hope, we hope that we, with a small molecule, are better than than our sort of at that time standard comparator, Adalimumab, and you will see this here in in the in the uh, marked uh, box on the left hand side that at, at week 12 the red uh, uh, column was higher than the blue one. So indeed, um, arsitinib was significantly better regarding ACR20 here and also other. Uh, endpoints subsequently uh, re regarding the efficacy compared to uh, uh, um, adalimumab. And so that was, of course, a very, very important information uh, that we can do even better than a very good biologic. This was uh, the finding of the RA beam. And now I will allude to this uh, a little bit more in detail to the newer agent, which is called Upadacitin. Utah-Alcidinib was designed, as Ernest Choi already pointed out, uh, to be uh, selective uh, against JAK1. And mind you, uh, you can never be specific. Uh, that's what I learned from my colleagues in pharmacology. If you have a small molecule, you can be specific with a biologic, but with a small molecule, you're only selective because if you add a lot, a lot of stuff, then the drug might still work. So uh, I will compare two trials here. The select next was comparing patients who had failed methotrexate in, uh, in, in principle and uh, were then investigated how they did with ACR20 or for, for, this was for the FDA uh, as an outcome parameter or test 28 CRP, low disease activity. And you see here, uh, this was all better than placebo. And uh, interestingly, this was also true for uh, the S28 CRP, the C dye, and the Boolean remission here. Let's have a look. Now, it is very important to compare these data to uh, patients who had failed already biologics, and some of them had failed quite a few biologics. Uh, um, including even anti-IL-6. And if you recall the data I showed you in the, in the previous section on the select next, the data are just as good here for you, Upadacitinib if you have failed biologics. And to me, very remarkable was on the right-hand side, you see uh, that even those patients who had failed tocilizumab and IL-6 inhibitor did quite well also Using upadacitinib, you also see that upadacitinib, 50 milligram per day, was just enough to mediate the effect, and that's why upadacitinib, upadacitinib 30, was no longer followed later on. And I will briefly allude to this study uh, uh, put forward by Ronald van Wollenhoven, and uh, the conclusion was that also in methotrexate naive patients. Mind you, the other patients I showed you had either failed methotrexate or biologics. These were the methotrexate naive patients. Yupa does sit in it, demonstrated significant and clinically meaningful improvement in rheumatoid arthritis, signs and symptoms versus methotrexate. And of particular note, radiographic progression was significantly less with Yupa does sit in it versus methotrexate. Safety events were consistent with phase two and three studies with UPA in RA to date. The next slide shows you another very important study. I already showed you the RA beam, and uh, this study called Select Compare compared upadacitinib and adalimumab like baricitinib uh, had done. You see UPA 15 uh, placebo. Adalimumab as a comparator, and then there was an important rescue period, and I will show you the data here. So uh, the initial period, you see that uh, uh, like uh, baricitinib, but even more impressive, I would say, impressive with uh, if you see that there were higher responses of the ACR20 using upadacitinib versus adalimumab, which is even more apparent if you look at DES28 CRP, less than 2.6, sort of an, uh, a remission equivalent here. 
And a very important uh, extension of that trial was that those patients who had failed upadacitinib could then move over to adalimumab, or those patients who had failed adalimumab could then move over to upadacitinib. This is, of course, a very, very important question in daily clinical practice because we had already always uh, wondered, well, what's going to happen if you fail even upadacitinib? Can you still be rescued with a TNF blocking agent? And yes, you see this here on the right-hand side that this is possible. So therefore, this trial was also very important. Uh, finally, I will show you regarding efficacy, <clears throat> another very interesting study, which is called Select Choice. Uh, unlike uh, most studies that use adalimumab as a comparator here, uh, a better sample was used as a comparator versus upadacitinib in patients who had failed biologics, and uh, um, it was looked for efficacy endpoints uh, uh, under the leadership of uh, Andrea robert Roth from, from Switzerland and Germany. And you again see the orange uh, bars versus the, the green bars, and you see that basically everywhere, uh, upadacitinib performed better than abatacept in the select compared trial. Uh, nevertheless, of course, it's always important to look into the safety profile. And here you see a little bit different picture because uh, if you now look into uh, the uh, orange dots, which are uh, abatacept uh, versus upadacitinib, uh, the uh, green triangle, triangles, you see that uh, mostly uh, there are more safety events regarding upadacitinib uh, compared to abatacept. So if you uh, are have a patient sitting in front of you um, who has failed the biologic and you are wondering, should I give uh, the f blocking agent or should I give, in this case, uh, abatacept versus uh, uh, upadacitinib, you must take the safety profile into account as well. If there are no particular issues, upadacitinib would be an option. If there are certain issues, abatacept might also be possible. So this is something you will have to weigh and discuss with a patient. And if you look particularly into the hepatic disorders, because I'm frequently asked, oh, what is this? These were primarily or basically always uh, transaminase elevations without clinical significance. So finally, let's go to thugotinib, the, the most recent newcomer. Uh, since it's quite a new drug, I will only show you a few examples here. And uh, you see uh, the, the study put forward by uh, Mark Genovese at, at the ACR 2019, also showing uh, that patients who had uh, failed biological DMARCs to go to NIP is an active drug. So now let's uh, ad address the question because I think you, you know this in daily clinical practice. Many patients ask, oh, do doctor, I believe you that this is a very efficacious drug, but what about the safety profile? And this is uh, was addressed as I can show you in the next slide, in the long-term safety of tofacitinib uh, over now 9.5 years, which I think is really quite long, so it's nearly a decade, looking into more than 7,000 patients, more than 22,000 patient years. And the uh, incident rates for serious adverse events was about nine for uh, um, Others, it was uh, was less, and, and most common infection. This is basically what we would see with uh, biologics as well. Uh, what stands out is the herpes zoster, and you see this here on, on that slide. There is an incident rate of about four cases of herpes zoster per 100 patient years. So luckily now, we can uh, vaccinate against it, and uh, I just learned that Chigrix is already is again available, at least in Germany, to be vaccinated against herpes zoster. So uh, this is uh, another compilation. If you look now into the serious infectious events and you compare it to adalimumab, methotrexate, you see basically uh, it has the same number, but what is sticking out is herpes zoster. And if you now look into the incident rates for serious infectious events in JAK inhibitors, you see here TOFA, BARI, and UPA. Basically, it's all uh, uh, in the uh, one range 
range. So there is is uh, so these drugs, at least in these clinical trials, are rather safe. So uh, Ernest Choi already put forward the uh, the data regarding uh, VTE. So we have a signal. This is definite uh, for uh, baricitinib and tofacitinib for herpes zoster, and the same is true for Eucaracetinib, but what about the uh, venous thromboembolic events? Actually, uh, this was a, 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 a no real signal in the uh, uh, tofacitinib clinical trials, at least in the initial ones, and then they came along. Hopefully, uh, it will advance again. Yes, the post marketing study with tofacitinib looking into uh, patients who uh, had. Uh, some cardiovascular risk factors, and then were treated with tofacitinib, and this showed a higher incidence, particularly for the 10 milligram dose, compared to the teen blocking agents. What we did not know at the time of, of these studies was that the teen F-blocking agents, and that has been shown now by um, Anja Strangfeld's group in, in Germany, they lower the risk of thromboembolic events, and so maybe that needs to be taken into account when you look at these data. So finally, what are my take-home messages regarding the JAK inhibitors? So we have small, uh, uh, several small molecules which are now approved in, in many countries, COFA, BAR, UPA, and just recently for Gotinib and in Japan, Eficitinib. The therapeutic success uh, shows you uh, the pathogenic importance of the cytokines involved in the inflammatory processes, and clinical efficacy has been demonstrated basically in all situations, mono combination therapy with DMARTs, DMART methotrexate inadequate responders, also biological inadequate responders, including TNF inhibitor resp uh, non-responders, and as a, what I mentioned now recently, abatacid as well. The safety profile does not generally, at least, appear to differ from biologics, acceptance for zoster. The jury is still out regarding thrombo, thrombotic events because Eupatacitinib did not show this. So, and for Gotinib, uh, we, we need to uh, look into the real life data, of course, but they, it didn't show it as well. Uh, infections in elderly patients may be an issue, and uh, especially if they have cardiovascular risk factor, and there's still the question of uh, VTEs and other comorbidities. What I personally find very, very exciting are the possible extensions of indications going to ankylosing spondylitis, cardiac arthritis, inflammatory bowel disease, lupus, even uh, atopic skin diseases, and a, a rare but very, very important, uh, scientifically important group of diseases, so-called interferonopathies. So now we have the renaissance of classical pharmacology because these are no biologic, they're small drugs, and they have interactions with drugs. And now you again have to ask your question, uh, detailed question to your patients. Well, do you drink uh, grapefruit juice, juice, or uh, what about uh, um, the the uh, uh, St. John Ward's uh, uh, drugs, and so on, So and, and uh, what about ketoconazole, and so on? Uh, something which is not uh, important for the biologics, but of course for the small molecules. And they are therefore certainly new and important tools in our therapeutic armamentarium. And so we hope that uh, these are the data from the German Rheumatism Research Center and showing you how we really have advanced in terms of disease activity over the recent years. So you see here, we started with uh, quite a high mean death 28 in 1997 when we did this. Uh, analysis and went down to lower numbers. And the question, of course, will be, and that's why I have a question mark there, will the JAK inhibitors even lower and will even lead to better results than we currently have? So my final slide is uh, <clears throat> just so something I took from, from the ACR Congress in, in Chicago. You see here all the, uh, the on the left-hand side, the JAK molecules distributed all over the place. They, co they combine when they see the cytokine 
But if you have a blocking agent, as you see on the right hand side on top or underneath uh, the uh, jack uh, um, chains, then the jacks are no longer working and we can mediate and improve uh, the inflammatory status to the benefit of all patients. With these words, I thank you very much for your attention. I'll be happy to ask Ed Professor Bumastel for your presentation. It was excellent. Uh, and in fact, I have two questions from our audience. First of all, uh, would you advocate uh, using a second jack inhibitor after the first one have failed, either for efficacy reasons or adverse events? Yeah, that's a very important question. And you, because you would say, well, I mean, how can a JAK1 selective agent work if, for instance, a JAK1 and 2 agent or JAK1 to 3 agent has not worked? So that doesn't actually scientifically doesn't make that much sense. But uh, uh, I mean, uh, the truth is in the clinic. And we have had several patients who had failed uh, one of the other JAK inhibitors, and out of desperation, we put these patients on upadacitinib because it just came along. And we felt, well, this poor patient has already failed uh, all biologics, all DMARTs, and uh, two, even two, we had one, even two, had failed uh, two, two decks. But out of this, our despair, we said, okay, let's, let's put this patient on upadacitinib. And I was amazed and, and really surprised that this patient did very well and is doing quite well. So scientifically, it doesn't make that much sense, but in real life, it works. So I would say, yes. Uh, it is worth trying, and I've talked to a couple of colleagues who have ha made similar uh, um, experiences. So I think uh, we are in a, uh, pretty much in the same ballpark as with the anti-TNF agents, where also we, we thought it wouldn't make sense to switch from adalimumab to uh, etanercept and vice versa, because they all attack the same molecule, but they still work. So. Uh, uh, so the human business system is not a test tube. It is a biological system, and there may be, in this case, pleasant surprises. And the second one is when prescribing a JEK inhibitor, would you choose a combined therapy using a JEK inhibitor and methotrexate, or would you prefer monotherapy? Well, what we usually do is if the patient tolerates methotrexate, we leave the methotrexate in. If the patient is then doing very well on, on the uh, JAK inhibitor, and this is quite common, I must say, uh, then we gradually dis discontinue methotrexate and try to, to go on with monotherapy. I think that's the easier way, unless the patient says, and this is also not so rare, well, doctor, I really can't stand this yellow stuff anymore. I, 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 wanna, I don't want to have it. Let's try it in, in, in monotherapy uh, right away because I cannot tolerate the agent. I get nauseated. I get sick. Uh, this is a different matter. But if the patient is, is tolerating methotrexate well, I leave it and discontinue it later. Okay. And we just received the third question for you. Uh, have you seen any significant safety signal from the German uh, rabbit registry? For JAK inhibitors, obviously. Yes, what we have truly seen is, and that was presented at ULAR, uh, are the herpes zoster, is the herpes zoster signal for, uh, for for Bari, Yupa, and Tofa. So this is uh, uh, this is four incidences of herpes zoster per 100 patient years. That is significant, and we must take this into account. And uh, I'm not sure about Romania. Uh, but we had a problem in Germany that we uh, that the vex vaccine against uh, against herpes zoster Ingrix was not available, so that we could not protect our patients against herpes. Currently, I just learned uh, that last week that it is available any uh, again. So I would always vaccinate my patients uh, against herpes zoster because this is uh, the most significant signal. Um, well, the, the jury is still out regarding venous thrombosis that we do not have uh, clear data yet. Thank you very much again, and please receive.